So one of the cool features of Toyota's factory scan tool is that it'll take a snapshot of data every half a second to show what's going on in the car. When a code sets, it'll take a freeze frame shot and it'll show you three half second shots before and one half second after so you can see what the vehicle was doing leading up to the code setting. So in 15.2 software, we added this feature in all of our Snap-on scan tools. I'm going to show you how we get to it. So I already have a code in this vehicle, so we're going to go into the engine. And I'm going to go to where it says freeze frame here on the top right. It's going to give me the codes. And you'll see down here there's a little piece, a little icon that looks like a film strip. So if you click on that, it's going to pull the data out of the PCM and it's going to be able to display it for us. So it's going to give us a little bit of a, a description of what it's doing. So once again, the ECM records engine conditions in the form of freeze frame data every half a second. Some codes will store five separate sets of freeze frame data. So we're going to have three data sets before, one data set when it happens, and one data set after. It's useful to simulate the condition of the vehicle around the time that the problem occurred. So we'll just hit continue. And then it's going to give us a description of what these PIDs are. Continue. And you'll see up on the top left here, it says it starts at freeze frame zero. So that's when the code actually set was freeze frame zero. So if I hit previous up there on the left, it's going to go negative one. And it'll go negative two. And negative three. And if I hit previous again, it's going to go back to where we were. And I can still go forward. So I'll go to negative two negative one, when the code actually happened, and then a little bit after the code. So we can see here what happened after the code set. So that's a pretty handy little tool to help you in figuring out why exactly that code set in this car. Hello everyone, welcome. Thanks for joining our diagnostics training today. Now, if you have any questions throughout the training, just uh, make sure that if you're watching on Zoom, just look at the top of the bottom of your screen, wherever your Zoom controls are, you should see a button that says Q&A, type in your question there, hit submit, and I'll get to those at the end of the session. If you're watching me on face, uh, yeah, YouTube right now, uh, just make sure you go in, use that live chat function wherever it is on your device that you're using and I'll get to those at the end as well. So my name is Jason Gabrinas. I'm one of Snap-on's National Diagnostic Technical Trainers. Been in the training department the last nine years or so, traveling around North America, helping Texan shop owners get the most out of their diagnostic equipment. Before I did that, it was a couple of years as a diagnostic sales rep with Snap-on, so I had about 30 different Snap-on franchisees I worked with, as well as the shops that they serviced in order to help everyone get the most out of their diagnostic needs. Before that, it was eight years at Subaru, so worked in a dealership, and over time, just became that uh, go-to guy in the shop, I guess, the Diag tech in the shop, so I ended, always ended up with the drivability problems, the intermittent problems, the weird wiring problems that would show up on those cars, and that's really where I cut my diagnostic teeth, was trying to figure out all those weird head-scratcher type problems that would come into my bay. And before that, a bunch of other miscellaneous wrenching jobs, been a little over 25 years under hood experience for me. That's enough about me. Let's talk about our topic at hand for this evening, which is going to be auxiliary emission systems, operation and testing. You might be thinking, well, what in the world are auxiliary emission systems? So I uh, built a list of some of maybe your less common emission control or emission devices that are on some vehicles. Some vehicles have them, some vehicles don't. Some manufacturers use them exclusively. Some manufacturers don't use them at all. Uh, so things like EGR valves, which would probably be the more common of this list, uh, air pumps, variable runner intakes, so that's definitely not on every manufacturer's list, tumble generator valves, and displacement on demand. So there's only certain manufacturers that use some of these. And a, a lot of it, the information is just like, it, it's not enough to really dedicate a half hour to each of these. So kind of lumping every, everybody together and putting them into this one uh, one presentation here. So first off, the EGR valve. And as I said, that's probably the most common one out of all of these systems on this list. And it stands for exhaust gas recirculation. So it does what it says on the tin, and it, it recirculates 
exhaust gas back into the intake. And it uses that uh, to reduce cylinder temps because it's putting that inert exhaust gas back into the combustion chamber. Reducing the cylinder temps helps reduce the NOx emissions. Now there's some trade-offs with that as well, um, but uh, it, it, does, it, it does its best to, to reduce those NOx. Now it can vary from fully open to fully closed and usually anywhere in between. There's, uh, there's two different types is vacuum controlled or an electronically operated, which would be more of like a stepper motor. So that gives us a lot more control over how wide it's opening. And it is used in both diesel and gasoline engines out there. So I think probably nowadays it's more prevalent in the diesel side of things because they're working pretty hard to get those emissions down. But you definitely see them on gasoline engines nowadays as well. Uh, I, I think maybe they were a little more popular on gasoline engines back in the day. They, they've done a lot better job with direct injection and things like that to be able to help mitigate some of that. But yeah, you, you, they're still out there. You'll still see them today. Uh, so there's a couple of different types. So first off is the uh, vacuum operated uh, EGR valve. So you see we got the intake manifold here. We got the combustion chamber in the engine. And then we have the exhaust comes out here. So off the exhaust, we have this tap, smaller, uh, smaller hard line goes into this EGR valve. As a, in this case, it has a vacuum diaphragm on the top, which is controlled by this solenoid, uh, this control solenoid, which has a supplied vacuum. So it's getting vacuum from the intake manifold. And then when the solenoid opens, it'll supply the vacuum to here, opens up the pintle, pulls it off the seat, allows the gas to flow. Uh, when it closes the solenoid, and it, it can be pulse width modulated as well, so it can open 10%, uh, 20%, 30%, percent, and so on. Uh, open and close by how much vacuum it sends that way. Uh, so that's the vacuum operated one runs off a little solenoid there. And then the uh, electronic valve has an, a stepper motor. So that is just a direct connection from the PCM to the EGR valve itself. And then it's a stepper motor. Once again, pulse and modulated, comes up and down. Uh, some vehicles you might also find an EGR cooler, which is kind of like a radiator. And what that'll do is that hot exhaust comes through it's going to cool it off a bit before it gets in there uh, just to keep the temperatures down as well. Uh, so here's a little bit more of a uh, detailed cross section of these valves. We have the vacuum operated one over here. As you can see, we got a spring, we got a pintle, goes down into this tapered seat. Exhaust comes in here, exhaust goes out there. Uh, so if the pintle opens up due to the vacuum inside this diaphragm, which pulls up on the, against the spring, it's going to pull up on this diaphragm, pull up on the pintle, and then the exhaust gas will be allowed to flow. On the electric, we have our coil right here. It's an electromagnet. And then we have this uh, pintle. It was also an EGR position sensor in this one. Not all electronic EGRs have this, but on the ones that do, it works kind of like a throttle position sensor where it has the uh, like rheostat type uh, effect going on in there. And then it, that, that all goes out the electrical connector. Same thing on the bottom though. We got a, a tapered pintle and a tapered pintle seat. Exhaust comes in, when it opens up, it comes out, and then it's allowed to flow into the engine that way. Now, you think about this, it's being open and exposed to the exhaust stream. So depending on how clean your vehicle is, that's probably one of the more common problems in an EGR valve is gonna be carbon buildup, failure due to carbon buildup. Uh, the pintle can stick in the carbon, it can just restrict the flow, the carbon restricts the flow can also have failed relearns due to carbon. I'll talk about that one in a second. And in order to test an EGR valve, you can use functional tests to turn it on and off or open and close it. And also component testing, uh, lab scope testing and the like are able to test it that way as well. So EGR valve relearn failure. So where we have this problem is when you do have an electronic EGR valve such as this. It wants, the computer wants to know when you replace it or when you do a relearn for it. You, uh, it, it's gonna run it up and down. So it's gonna run it open to close because it wants to find out where is the bottom of travel, so where is close. Problem being, if you have some carbon in here and you get a little piece of carbon sticks to the seat, it's not gonna close all the way, but it's gonna be the end of the travel for the pintle. So according to the computer's mind, what the computer's thinking is, oh, that's the bottom, that's closed. Now maybe that little piece of carbon gets loose, it opens up, next time it opens up, that piece of carbon falls back out and then it closes and now it's not making a seal because the carbon isn't there anymore and it's able to leave vacuum by there. So it could cause a vacuum leak, could cause a drivability issue with the vehicle 
uh, just by having that little extra hole open right there where the carbon was and the carbon falls out. I've seen that happen before where it fails the relearn or it relearns and then it gets stuck and then that piece of carbon falls out and then you have that problem there where the exhaust is able to leak by even though the computer thinks it's closed. So it throws a, throws a fit, throws a code and says, uh, well, I, I, I guess we have a leak now, um, which could be solved by just well cleaning the valve for one thing and then doing a relearn after that as well. Now on to air pumps. Air pumps have been around for a while, if you think about it, since the 60s, really. Uh, what it does is it adds high pressure air to the exhaust, which in turn adds oxygen and nitrogen and whatnot. It leans out the exhaust, which allows the cat to reach a temperature quicker, which makes it easier for the emissions to start, uh, the emissions controls to start performing. Could be belt driven on the older models and a lot of the newer models that have it are electric type and looks kind of like this guy right here. Looks a little blower motor. So here's the original air pumps back, back 60s, 70s, 80s. I remember selling quite a few of these when I was in a parts store. You'd always have these rails in here and you know, the, the belt driven air pumps on, runs off a of V-belt. And then we have this little uh, valve right here. It's gonna open and close. It's gonna allow the air to flow through the valves. I uh, also have these one-way valves here as, as well to allow the air to not flow backwards out of the exhaust, only into the exhaust. And like I said, it pumps air into the exhaust system. Here's an example of an electric one. This is off a of Subaru. Uh, used to work on these all the time. They put these on the turbo motors for a while. Back in the mid-2000s, 2006, 2007, somewhere around there, they started putting them on. And it's an electric pump. And then you see it's got the hoses. It's got this diverter valve that's, that sends them to each side. We have these electric stepper motor valves that open and close, and we'll talk more about that in a second. Uh, but these valves open and close and provide the airflow into, in this case, this is back to the exhaust valve back here uh, on both sides. The problem being is these things can, can have problems and the motor itself can have problems as well. So the electric pumps and also on these valves, you can get water intrusion. Water intrusion due to condensation inside the lines, inside the valves coming out of the exhaust. Uh, very common codes on these types of vehicles are PO, PO410 and PO411, passenger side, driver side valves issues, uh, can cause the pumps to seize as well. I've seen that happen. Valves seize a lot. And uh, fun thing on Subaru too, is these valves are underneath the intake. They're kind of like there, but not that easy to get to. And the gaskets are made of metal and they're very thin and they're like razors. So you got to be very, very careful if you're working on one of these, I'm sure the other manufacturers are very similar in the way that they design it. So just be really careful because for some reason they just leave a giant tab sticking out of the metal gasket. And it's like, if you're not, not wearing gloves, it could be a, a bad time. Uh, ask me how I know that, but uh, can cause a problem. So just be aware, you know, if you have an air pump problem, a lot of times it's gonna be water intrusion. Here's a couple examples here of where we have a problem. This is on a motor and you see how it's kind of got a lot of corrosion in there. And then that's on one of the valves. You see how it's all corroded inside as well. So they can get all stopped up, gunked up, don't operate the way they're supposed to. And then, you know, throw a code or throw a performance issue, drivability problem, perhaps. Probably more an emissions problem. But if it's stuck open, I suppose you could have a drivability problem with the exhaust going where it's not supposed to go. And then we have variable runner intakes. So there's a couple different ways that manufacturers go about. Uh, I remember back uh, a couple cars ago, I had a 94 Acura Integra GSR. So the GSR was the, the fancy one before the Type R came out. And that had a variable runner intake, I remember. So it had a longer, longer runner for low speeds and a shorter runner for high speeds. And when it got to a certain RPM, those air flaps, those, those butterfly valves, and they were open up and you could hear it in the intake. You could hear it change the tone of the vehicle. So it, it just changes the distance that the air needs to travel in order to increase low RPM torque. Uh, it allows the torque to vary as well, depending on the load. So in this case, this one's off, uh, I think it's off a of BMW, I'm pretty sure. Oh yeah, it's a BMW's DESA system. So air comes in and you can see it's got two different chambers. It goes to each of the six cylinders. And we have these butterfly valves in the middle here. So this would be your throttle plate. And uh, at low RPM, it's gonna take the longest route through that's pretty much just a straight shot around each side. At mid-range RPM, you see this middle one opens up and then we have the air is taking, it's still, it's, it's long time there, but we also are using the back pressure 
out of the engine to scavenge a little bit more air as well to change the RPM curve there. And then the same thing here at high RPM, both are open. And then it's allowing the air to come through and scavenge more air coming back through using the, the, the pulses back and allows it to flow a little bit better that way as well. So a couple of different ways to do that. A bunch of manufacturers use different ways. Here's the other BMW system, the BMW Diva system. So the last one was DISA. This one's Diva. So this is a, a continuously variable runner intake. So this is essentially infinitely variable. So we have the external uh, part of the intake and we have this ring in the center. You see how it's kind of like a little weird shaped wheel. So what it'll do is it's on a, it's on a rod and that'll turn depending on which way it turns and how much it turns and what way it turns, it changes the geometry of the intake and it can change it by however many degrees it wants to uh, up to whatever the limit is of the system. But it's, it's able to do that and reshape the intake manifold uh, just by doing that. So it's a pretty tall intake manifold to have all this in there, but uh, it is continually variable. As far as I know, it's really the only one that uses that continually variable intake so that's out there and there's some actuators that are used on a position sensors and so on uh, much like just about anything else then we have tumble generator valves so that kind of goes a little bit hand in hand with our variable runner intakes we also have tumble generation valves in here so increases swirl in the intake system which increases combustion efficiency especially at low speeds startup low rpm increases the low and mid speed torque there so if we take a look at this graphic on the left-hand side, we have just standard airflow with this butterfly valve open. When the butterfly valve is open, we just have full-on airflow, and it's just going to do whatever it's whatever it's going to do. On the when the valve is closed, and we can see it forces the air up and around to the smaller chamber. There's a smaller chamber here and a larger chamber down there. Forces it through the uh, smaller chamber at the top, which forces it to swirl when it goes into the cylinder. So it's used to have more complete combustion at idle, low RPM, that type of thing. So a couple of different ways they actuate that. Here's a little closer look at that system. And we can see it's got an actuator with an arm that opens and closes. It's just got a little connecting rod and it's got a uh, uh, stepper motor in there to open or to close it. So this is on a, uh, a variable charge motion actuator, they call it on a Hyundai. So that's, that's just how that kind of looks. I don't know on Subarus, they've had those for a long time as well. Uh, on the older ones, like the early WRXs I know had them, what it would do is it would close when you first start the vehicle and then it would run for idle until it warmed up and then they would, they would open. Uh, and then also if you touch the accelerator pedal at all or started moving, it would open them up and they would just stay open. On the newer models that they have that, it would open and then it would close back again. It said, say I was on driving around part throttle with a cold engine, it would open and close as I open and close the throttle, just depending on what the load is on the vehicle. If I'm sitting at idle, I'll still close them up until it got warmed up. So there's a couple of different ways they operate. And it is good to understand which kind of system you're working on. So you always want to read your manufacturer's information as to how does this system operate? Because they all like to do something a little bit different. They work off the same principle, but maybe they open once and then they stay open or maybe they open and close. Depends on how the manufacturer has it. So if, if you see it and it's opening and closing and it's not supposed to open and close, it's only supposed to open once, then you'll know there's an error in the system and vice versa. So that's tumble generation. And now we have our displacement on demand. So a couple manufacturers use this. Uh, GM uses it a Honda I'm sure there's some other manufacturers out there that do as well. So what it does, it cuts out cylinders on larger engines. So it can cut out four cylinders on a V8, three on a V6, increases fuel economy while I'm at cruising speeds. If I'm just cruising down the highway part throttle 55 miles an hour, I don't need eight cylinders to push me down the road. I, I can get by with four. So that's what these manufacturers do. So in this case, this is on a uh, Honda system. And what this does is they can drive on six cylinders, three cylinders, or four cylinders. So it'll either shut down two cylinders, it'll shut down a bank, or it'll run on the full six cylinders. So if I'm just idling, the computer is going to be programmed to know, well, if I'm idling, I'm probably going to need to accelerate at some point. So it's going to keep you in six cylinder mode until you accelerate. Then you get up to a certain point where you're going to be cruising. 
then you only need three cylinders to keep that moving down the road because it doesn't take a lot of energy to keep that momentum moving down the road. And then we have uh, D cell, so you're going to be in fuel cuts. You don't need to worry about that at all. And then we're still cruising again here, so we're going to stay in that three cylinder drive mode because we're still in cruise. D cell again, go down to idle. Well, for idling, we're in six cylinder. And then we accelerate back up. We cruise in three cylinders. If I am cruising and then I need to increase my speed a bit, maybe it'll add it to go into four cylinder drive mode in that case. So I'm already cruising at 55. I want to get to 65. So it gives me that little extra, one extra cylinder worth of power, uh, but it doesn't go into the full on six cylinder mode until it absolutely positively needs it. Now, how does it do this? It does it using oil control. It's very much, very similar and kind of uh, in a way, very well intertwined with the VTEC system that Honda uses. It all uses oil pressure and it uh, uses the rocker arms in order to do this. So we have six cylinder, in this case, this has VTEC as well. So we have a high, high lift cam and a low lift cam. We talked more about this in a, a, another video talking about VTEC, variable valve timing video, if you don't check that out. But uh, we've high lift and low lift. And then in three cylinder mode, it cuts out three of the cylinders, cuts out one whole bank, and then it leaves the other cylinders firing. So if we take a look at this, Works very similar, like I said, to VTEX. We have these pins inside the rocker arms. We have high rockers, low rockers, primary and secondary rockers. We have oil pressure switches and we have solenoids. So the solenoid is going to be a pulse width modulated solenoid. So you'd look at that like any other pulse width modulated <coughs> solenoid that you'd see. In this case, it operates on oil pressure. So the springs you see, there's a spring next to each one of these pins. And the spring by default is going to lock these pins in place. So it's going to push push through and it's gonna lock those rockers in place. When it's just operating like that, all the cylinders are open and closed just like they normally would. <clears throat> if we go down to a four cylinder operation, what it's gonna do is it's only gonna shut off the two back cylinders. So you can see the oil pressure goes in here, pushes the spring over and allows this rocker arm to just kind of free float, not do anything. So it's not gonna be pushed by the camshaft. So it's just gonna sit there with the valves. Pulled. Same thing with the other side, it's going to keep the valves from opening. They're just going to stay in their standard default closed state. And then uh, the, the oil overrides the springs. And if I want to go in six cylinder mode, in this case, we're going to kill this whole bank of cylinders. So oil pressure flows into all the passages and all the cylinders and just makes those rockers just sit there. So it's not moving. Uh, so in this case, you're just idling there and then the camshaft's just kind of spinning. It's not really doing anything at that point because it, it, it can't push down. I mean, it's going to push down on the rockers. They're not going to do anything. It's just going to kind of sit there idle. It's going to have the, the, the rockers there, but it's not going to push on the arms uh, for, the, for the valves. So that's how Honda does it. Here's how GM does it. GM also has an oil control displacement on demand uh, system. So they do it a little bit different because they do it on a push rod motor. Instead of having the overhead cam like they would on a Honda, they have a push rod. So we have a push rod and we have the lifter. It's a roller lifter. And it rides on the camel clothes. You notice there is a pin here. It's a pin in a spring, just like on Honda's system. Uh, by default, it keeps the spring and the pin in there and it locks it in place. So the whole assembly moves up and down with the camshaft. This is what it looks like uh, without a cross section. So you've got an oil port right there. When oil flows into the port, it overrides the spring, it pushes the pins out. That way, this outer portion here. See that outer portion there? Rides on the camshaft, but the push rod stays in place. Push rod stays right here. You can see on this side where, where we have this gap here. So push rod stays in place and this sleeve moves up and around that push rod. So we don't have, uh, so we don't push on the push rod so we don't open, open the valves on this. So it also cuts the fuel in the ignition as well, but it just makes it so it's not opening. It just kind of kind of uses it in that way. Problems we could have, a lot of rocker problems on these or lifter problems on these. If you have a lifter problem, it's probably going to grind out your camshaft as well. But a lot of lifter problems, I've been told, show up on these vehicles as well. And then also with GM, they took that to an extreme, and now they have what they call dynamic skip fire. So depending on the torque demand of the motor, it'll, it'll selectively turn off individual cylinders, turn off the ignition, on individual cylinders in order to make the lower power or the higher power. I'll, I'll fire all eight, or maybe I'll skip this one. 
That's why they call it dynamic skip fire because it'll skip a cylinder dynamically depending on the load of the vehicle. So I could be running on four cylinders, could be running on six, seven, eight, anywhere in between on these cylinders because uh, it'll, it'll just skip firing a cylinder depending on the needs of the engine. So that's, that's kind of their newer system. And that's all computer controlled based on RPM and load and all that good stuff. So just a lot of tech out there with this, this type of thing. So it's definitely out there. Definitely a good idea to read up on how this stuff works. Uh, so you can understand it a little better when you're trying to diagnose it when it does eventually fail because we know it's going to fail at some point. All right, let's take a look at the... All right, a couple of different vehicles I want to show with a couple of different systems. First one I have is the Toyota Tundra. And that is going to show us the air injection system so i have a 2017 toyota tundra and the first place i want to go is going to be my guided component test now if you have a snap-on tool with a lab scope in it so it's going to be your varus your zeus your verdict your modus your uh, triton and your advantage is going to have a guided component test module so this is a database of over 5 million individual component tests uh, it goes back to 1981, covers most of the vehicles that we cover in the scanner. And in this case, uh, I've loaded in that it's 2017 Tundra. I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven systems that I can test stuff with. So in this case, we'll go into the engine because that's where we're going to look for uh, my different systems here. So this has air injection systems. So that's right there on the top in the middle. First thing that's listed on any component or any subsystem is going to be component information. It's going to tell us how it operates. So in order to reduce cold engine emissions and warm up the three-way cat quicker during cold engine operation, engine coolant temperature between 41 and 104 degrees, an air injection control system has been added to this model. Secondary air injection is supplied by a DC electric motor driving an impeller. Air injection control driver controls air pump under direction of the ECM. Clean air enters the pump through an air filter. Downstream of the air pump, pressurized air enters two electrically controlled air switching control valves with pressure sensor. When the ECM command switches air switching control valve open, air is supplied to each bank through air injection port in the exhaust manifold. Air injection pressure and exhaust gas pulses are monitored by the air pressure sensor. Sensor may also be called a turbo pressure sensor in that case as well. <laughs> After that, we can go and take a look. We have air pump, air switching valve, and the secondary air pressure sensor. First, first off the pump, Pump is activated by the ECM to add oxygen to the exhaust on startup and assist with warming up the cap. Electric air pump consists of a DC motor driving an impeller. Rotation of the impeller pressurizes the air. Electric air pump is part of the air pump assembly. Assembly is located behind the right front bumper area and can be accessed by removing the lower front fender liner in that area. So I have to remove my fender liner to get to it. Air pump mounted on the left side is for bank one, right side for bank two. So in this case, it has two air pumps on this vehicle as well. And we can see our different pin assignments here as to uh, what we have going on. Let's see, uh, bank one air injection control, bank two air injection control, and then we have the uh, different pumps connectors there as well. Uh, let's see, it tells us where we can connect it. Connectors are located in the near engine room relay box on the left fender skirt just below brake master cylinder, part of the air pump assembly. We hit the back button, we got a functional test and a resistance test. So functional test, uh, continued air pump functional testing can cause pump overheating. Limit testing to no more than four attempts at five seconds each with a 30 second interval between tests. If you need more than four attempts, let the system cool for up to 10 minutes. So we wanna make sure of that. Uh, let's see, so we're gonna check for 12 volts. And uh, let's see, we, we, we can uh, run it. We can, this is basically hot wiring is what this is telling us. So we're gonna run it, we're gonna hot wire it, and we're gonna make, make sure it runs. We can also do a resistance test as well. Depending on temperature, resistance should be in the following ranges. So at uh, negative four degrees Fahrenheit, it should be this. Up to 68 degrees Fahrenheit, it should be this. And then of course, it'll be lower the higher the temperature. Uh, so you're gonna use your red and blue connectors in that case, and we're gonna test the resistance there. Also the air switching valve, which is part of that. So the solenoid uses the air injection system to allow or block air traveling from the air injection pump to the exhaust stream. The use of the solenoid replaces the prior use of conventional check valves. Air switching valve is electrically controlled. That is used to open shut air pressure. Air switching valve is under the air injection control driver direction. When the valve is closed, exhaust pressure is prevented from entering the air injection pump. When it's open, pressure from the electric pump is added to the exhaust stream to reduce hydrocarbon. 
air pressure sensor is part of the valve and the valve may be called an air injection control valve. So here's our different pin assignments there again, bank one, bank two, a couple different versions on this one. Best place to test it is at the air switching valve and then it gives you the location. So one's on the left side valve cover, one's on the right side. Valve. Sounds like it's easy enough to get to. Uh, once again, we do a functional test on this. Gonna open and close. Apply 12 volts to the valve pin five and ground pin one. Should now Air should now pass between the two large ports. So that's gonna open and close it. We can also use the scanner to do that, to, to verify the circuit. And there's also a resistance test on this as well. Pin one and pin five should be four and a half to five and a half ohms at 60. So a lot of different tests we can do. We got an air pressure sensor in here as well, which is gonna operate probably pretty similar to a, you know, a five volt reference can be pretty similar to a map sensor. I would imagine. Uh, see, key on engine off should be 3.6 3 volts. Key on, uh, use hand pressure pump to apply up to half a PSI. Key on voltage should change as pressure changes. So it's going to tell us how to walk through that uh, system on that vehicle. Uh, Ray's asking, I just saw a question pop up on, on YouTube. Is air injection pump always necessary? No. No. It's for emissions purposes. So Car will still run. I know there's places that sell block off plates. It's not telling you that that's what the manufacturer wants you to do, but um, it's not necessary for the vehicle to run. It's necessary to keep the emissions where the manufacturer wants it. So do with that information what you will there. All right, let's look at a 2018 Hyundai Santa Fe as well. This one's going to be the... Uh, Variable runner intake. Actually, tumble generator valves on this one. Tumble generator valve on this one. There you go. We got an actuator, we got a sensor. So the actuator itself, use an electronically controlled butterfly valve in each intake runner port. That code idle tumble generator system will redirect the air charge through a different port. These ports have a finished characteristic that causes air fuel mixture to swirl and tumble greatly and create better combustion. This results in greater idle quality, cleaner emissions, and easier cold starts. Once the vehicle warms up, Tumble generator system will be deactivated and the intake air charge will be directed through the standard intake port. So in this case, it goes until it warms up. Hyundai calls this component variable charge motion actuator. ECM PCM controls the motor in on off state. It's normally in a closed state when started, but opens when accelerated 2600 RPM. Here's my connector, it gives me my actuator and my sensors all in one. If I do a DC voltage test, it should be 1.8 volts approximately uh, between the positive and negative. If I go to the sensor, sensor is going to work very much like a throttle position sensor. So we're going to check it. DC voltage test could be approximately 1.7 volts at idle, 3.2 volts uh, from a closed open status. So it should go rise from 1.7 up to 3.2 volts uh, from closed to open. Let's see what that might look like on my computer. So that's just, this should just be a standard DC volts test. Right? Yeah, so if I'm at idle, it should be up. Oh, that's not plugged in. All right. So you'll be able to see a rise and fall in an unbroken line on the screen. So it's going to give you a little 10-second window. It should be, should be up to 1.7 to about 3.2. So you're going to see a little up and down action right there as it opens and closes. How about on the scanner side? I believe we got some scanner side stuff we can talk about on this Hyundai as well. Tumble generator actuator. So if I go into my engine, it should be a functional test. And you see, we got a ton of functional tests in here. And we are looking for the variable charge mode. Okay, so this is just a start and stop. So all it does is turn it on, turn it off. So I'm gonna start it, it's gonna run it through, I'm gonna hit stop, it's gonna turn it off. So it's just an on and off motor operation uh, in that case. So the next thing we're gonna look at is gonna be a uh, Chevy Impala. And this one has an EGR valve on. So in this case, we're gonna look first at the functional tests. So another question I get asked is, well, I, I can't find this test. I can't find this test. Where's this test? So sometimes the test is called out here, like the EVAP service bay test, injector balance test. 
Sometimes it's called an output control as well. So if you go into output controls, it's going to give you a lot of your on off type um, tests that you're going to do where you're going to bypass the ECM control to turn things on and off. So in this case, EGR valve we're talking about, EGR percent. All right, so we have our EGR valve percentage here. We can just simply run it up 20%, 30%, 40%, run it up and down all the way up to 100%, right? So with that, we can also see and verify if it's working on the other end of the, end of the spectrum as well. So let me get my scope hooked back up here. So let me mount that up for some reason. And let's see if pulse width modulation works for you tonight. There you go. Uh, there. Okay, so let's say I'm functioning this with my scan tool. And if I happen to have a Windows-based scan tool, I can do something kind of cool. It's very helpful. So if I go back to my guided component test, <coughs> I can pull up my engine and pull up my EGR. And then I can do a duty cycle test because I want to check my duty cycle test. But it's telling me over there I'm doing well, my functional test is a duty cycle. So if I do a duty cycle on the other side, hit V-meter, let's see how this is doing today. Oh, we are not playing nice today, I guess. Oh, there we go. Oh, kind of, sort of. My knob's a little broken today. Yeah, that's about it. Okay. So I would be able to see my duty cycle cycling through up and down. In this case, we're at a 60% duty cycle. So if I open my meter, I'm going to make it full screen. Hit meter again, it's going to make it a window. Now, this only works on Windows based tools, but if you have one, it's pretty handy. So let's say I'm running that at 60%. I can come down here at the bottom, pull that up, pull up my scope again, grab it, move it over, move it over, and then I can see my percentage. So I'm about 60% here, I'm 60% there. Now, if I move it down to 50, 40, 30%, and it doesn't move, then we got a problem. Uh, if it does move, it should go down to 50, 40, 30%. You should see the line step down, step up. Like I said, I'm having a little bit. Oh, there it goes. Now it works. So if I'm down to 30%, I see it go down to 30%, then I know it's reacting properly. We would be connected to the EGR valve on the right hand side here, and then we're scanner control on the left side here as well. Uh, so that's kind of a handy little thing you can do. Otherwise, if you got a non-Windows based tool, you can just kind of flip back and forth and say, okay, well, I'm running it at this and I can see. Other times you use two tools. Some folks like having multiple tools, one with the scanner, one with the scope, and uh, you can do it that way as well. It's just very handy how you can do it all in one tool with that. All right, and one more we're going to look at is BMW. So you got this BMW 7 series, and that's going to have the variable runner intake system. So if we go into engine, we have the variable intake system right here. Operation of the variable intake manifold is controlled by a powerful output stage located inside the ECM. Power and ground both come from the ECM. Intake runners are lengthened or shortened by a rotating rotor, which is turned by a 12-volt DC motor. So that's that big rotor inside. When the 12 volt motor rotates, the rotor of the length of the intake runners is changed, and any intake length can be set between the two end stops. So, from fully the longest to the shortest, and anywhere in between. The drive for the rotor is 12 volt DC motor and a warm, worm gear rack mechanism. Tensioner provides precise position at all times for the variable intake runner. Variable intake manifold control motor is mounted on the back of the intake manifold. You'll need to remove both lower microfilter housings and the engine bulkhead, which is mounted to the firewall in order to gain access to the variable intake manifold control motor. Sounds super easy to get to. If motor replacement is necessary, you'll need to disconnect the main engine harness from various sensors and actuators surrounding the intake manifold to gain enough flex in the harness to remove the intake manifold motor from the vehicles. All good stuff to know. Also sounds like something not fun. If the motor should fail, the intake manifold will retain its position and a noticeable lack of vehicle power will be noticed. That's a good little note. So if the motor fails in any position, it's only going to have whatever that runner is. So in that, where it failed, going to have decent power, but anywhere else it probably won't. 
So that's a good tech note. And then we have a signature test because that's pulse width modulated as well. Uh, we should see a plus and minus, and we should see it go up and down. We should be able to see the waveform. Uh, 14 negative to 14 positive and vice versa. This delay of up to 90 milliseconds for the waveform to invert. So you'll see a flat line for up to 90 milliseconds before you see the waveform. So it's going to go up and down with 90 milliseconds in between. Uh, it's kind of like a pulse that modulated. It's going to be in, at 14 volts. Though. So, you know, we got the PCM connector there and we got the actual motor control there as well. So a lot of information to be had on that BMW system as well. All right, so with that, that is my time for this evening. Let's talk about what we're gonna talk about next week. Next week, we are talking about one of my most favorite tools is gonna to be the thermal imager. We're gonna revisit the thermal imaging that we've talked about before with some new information, some new uh, pictures, some new diagnostic information when it comes to using thermal imaging. So definitely if you have more, want more information on thermal imaging and how you can use it in your diagnostic day and not even your diagnostic day, I just, just in my general overview of the car day, because uh, I know most places do will do digital vehicle inspections now. So that's a really a good combo to go with that. So join me next week, six and nine Eastern, same time, same place. Go to snapon.com slash OT if you want to join me on Zoom. Otherwise, the 6 p.m. class goes to YouTube, so youtube.com slash snap on diagnostics. If you are watching on YouTube, please make sure you subscribe and like the video. Definitely greatly appreciate it. Got a lot of likes today. Thank you very much. It helps with that silly algorithm we got to play with. So uh, the more people that subscribe and like it and all that good stuff allows us to do more good stuff as well. Uh, also, if you want to see any of our past episodes, I got to update this slide. We got 47 episodes now. Uh, but any of the previous live stream topics, ADOS, Data bus testing, component testing series we did last summer, uh, basic electronics, variable valve timing, all of that information is still available on our YouTube channel as well, 100% for free. So definitely go check that out if that is of interest to you. Uh, now it's time for Q&A. Looks like we're clear on Zoom. I got a couple people I want to say hi to on YouTube. But before I do, I want to make sure I mention my buddy Al as well. Al also does free diagnostics training and his is on specific scan tools. Monday's on Apollo, Wednesday's on Zeus, and Thursday's on Triton. So um, it's going to be the first hour, pretty much the same on, on any of the tools. It's going to be on that specific tool. It's really made for you to be sitting there with your tool in front of you, kind of walking along, following along with what Al's doing on your computer screen. It's going to be everything from let's set up your Wi-Fi. Let's see, set up your free Snap on Cloud account. Make sure you can share files with your customers. And uh, all the way through, uh, let's talk about fast track intelligent diagnostics and the scanner functions. How does it help me as a technician diagnose a car fast? That's the first hour. On Wednesday and Thursday, since those tools also have guided component test and scope and meter functions, it takes about a five minute break, goes through the scope and meter functions as well on the Zeus and the Triton, gives you some real world examples, walks you through. Here's how you would set up your, your sweep. Here's how you'd set up your scale, et cetera, with the scope. So it's really a thorough class. Al's been with us well over 30 years. Uh, definitely a deep well of Snap-on Diagnostics knowledge. So worth your time to check him out. Uh, so once again, snapon.com slash OT. He only does Zoom. So if you want to join him, save your seat. Five and eight central, six and nine Eastern. Same deal there. With that, let's look. We got a couple things here. Uh, let's see. Raymond says hello. Hello, Raymond. Uh, good to see you. Abel, good to see you as well. Nick over from England. Good to see you. Uh, Bupendra Singh, hello, sir. Hello, sir. Thank you for joining me today. And thank you for everybody else who joined us who didn't necessarily comment, but that's fine too. You don't have to comment, but thank you for joining me anyways, whether you did or not. Works either way. Uh, hopefully you picked up some tips and tricks on these auxiliary emissions type systems that we talked about today. Hopefully you'll join me again next week uh, for Thermal Imager Revisited. With that, enjoy the rest of your week. Enjoy your weekend. Hopefully we'll see you next week. Have a good evening. Take care.